works with me. So I'll uh, I'll click my talk button and be quiet. And I guess let John take over. Okay, I think we can probably uh, get started. Um, I have a couple of things. I have a message for you from Chris Linder. This is directed mainly at the students. Um, he asked me to give you two messages. The first one is that you need to log in and change your password. Uh, he sent you a message about how to do this over your email, so you should have that information. The second one is that he wants you to send him a headshot which I'm sure you all have from any previous attempt you've made at a modeling career, you probably still have those headshots left over. So feel free to just use those. Um, he needs this information or to, uh, to update the website. Okay, now, if, uh, if my sound sounds good to you, uh, if, if you can hear me okay, uh, do the raise your hand thing. Okay, great. All right, that looks good. Now lower your hands. Um, so we're going to try something. Thanks, Max. Uh, we're going to try something a little different here. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I recorded uh, Bill giving uh, a little presentation about carbon cycling in aquatic ecosystems, and uh, I really want you to hear this from him because he does a really nice job and he puts a lot of detail in. Um, so we're going to try this thing. We're going to play that that recording, and the way that we're going to do this is I'm going to switch us over to the website where the link is, where the YouTube video is. So uh, the goal here is to make Bill a YouTube sensation. So we're going to watch this and then we're going to send this to uh, all of our friends so that he can get a few million hits. Uh, partly because what he's, what he's saying is actually quite important. Um, so we want as many people to hear about this as possible. So uh, we want Bill to be a YouTube sensation. So uh, as soon as I do this, what should happen is the website will open and the video will immediately start playing. Now what I want you all to do is when that happens just raise your hand so that I know that you are actually watching the video. And then we're just going to watch this video through. I think it's about 17 minutes long. And at the, when the video is over then uh, I want you to lower your hand. So leave your hands up while you're watching the video. Lower your hands when you're done. And then if you finish before everybody else, um, then I'll know you fast forwarded over some parts. And uh, you can just sit tight and wait. As soon as everybody has seen the video, then I'll switch this back over to the PowerPoint and I'll give, a, give a, about a 15 to 20 minute, I think, uh, presentation on some, some more details about some of the things that we've done in the stream today. Uh, are there any questions about that before I uh, switch this over to the website? Okay. Uh, then I'm going to go ahead and turn my talk button off and I'm going to switch this now. So remember, as soon as the video starts, raise your hand. If it doesn't start right away, just click play and then raise your hand. Okay, I think everyone's done. Um, Karen, I don't know if you're not done, if you just left your hand up. Uh, so, Karen, if you're done, drop your hand. Okay, great. Um, I hope that actually worked. I know we had a few people come in late after we started the video, and I don't think they saw uh, anything of that. I think they were all looking at this, which you should all now have a PowerPoint slide of the Coloma River and the Arctic Ocean in front of you. Um, if that's not true, uh, raise your hand or give me some kind of signal. Um, if I don't hear anything at all, I'm going to assume that you're all seeing the... Uh, okay, there's one. You're all seeing that, the, the Arctic Ocean and the River. 
Uh, looks like we have one person who might not be. Um, Tati, is that true? If, if you can't see that, raise your hand again. Okay, great. Um, so, are there any, first of all, are there any questions about what Bill just uh, talked to us about that you want to bring up now before I start? Just raise your hand if you have a question. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and just pick up sort of where Bill left off. This uh, presentation is sort of separate from what he was talking about, but if there are some connections there. And I'm going to bring us back to the, uh, the uh, Coma River. And, uh, you know, I, Bill once, once said at a talk, uh, he showed this picture and he said, if you're a limnologist, this is what heaven looks like. And, and I, I like that line, so I've stolen it from him. And I made it my own in a few, in a few different places. And, it, you know, the, one of the remarkable things about this place is the incredible diversity of aquatic ecosystems. And you can't even see the little streams, which, you know, in my opinion, are maybe the most important part of the landscape of all. So uh, what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about what, some things that we know, show you a little bit of data, tell, tell you about some of the things that we've been doing in small streams um, and why they're important and show you a little bit of data and uh, just to give you a sense of what we're doing. It's not, this is not particularly as polished as bills, but hopefully it'll be comprehensible um, and maybe even mildly entertaining, although maybe that's too ambitious. Um, so to start out with, uh, this Cherokee's right here. This is where most of the, a lot of sampling has been done for, for quite a long time. And I'm going to just start off by showing you some old data. Uh, this is data that uh, was published in a paper by Finley et al. Uh, a few years back that you should be able to get a copy of. I think we can get a link to that through the website. And we have updated these data. Um, and so I'm just going to use these to sort of illustrate a couple of ideas. And I think we'll probably hear more from Paul about, uh, um, from Paul about these data and, and he'll fill in some of the gaps that, that I'm going to leave behind. Um, now, a couple of things jump right out, I think, when you look at this graph. And you can see that there is a pretty regular pattern, and there are some pretty large changes that occur over time, but they tend to be fairly predictable. So you can, I think you can see, and uh, let me see here. I think you can see here that when the ice out starts, right about here, um, the first thing that happens is you get this massive flow of water, this massive discharge that uh, comes right after the, the ice breakup, and it just sort of barrels down the channel, destroying everything in its way, and it just really flushes the system out, and it carries with it, um, that's the, the, the uh, uh, solid line is discharge. It's just the amount of water that's flowing out the mouth of the river. Uh, it also carries with it a large amount of this. This is dissolved organic carbon. The dots represent the concentration of dissolved organic carbon. So during the, the spring, flush, you get large amounts of water and large amounts of carbon being transported. Now, urine's not here, so we can safely ignore POC at this point, and uh, I don't think anyone will get too upset. So I'm just going to skip over that part. But you can add that to this. The particular organic carbon is also being transported. Now, the other pattern that's, that's pretty clear is that uh, over time, you get this decline in both discharge and DOC concentration. And when you get down here, which is about when you guys are going to be, be out there, you're going to be uh, traveling there when we're on the descending limb of this, uh, discharge and dissolved organic carbon decline together. Now, the other thing that's important to know about this is that this carbon here is labile, which means that it's really young. This is like, imagine your favorite dessert. Uh, for me, it's like ginger snaps. Uh, that this is the kind of stuff that people really, really want, that, that the microbes really want to eat. They're not really people. Um, so, this, this, so we call that labile DOC. When, once we get here, uh, this stuff is, the concentration is lower, but it's also more refractory. It's like, uh, for me, it would be like uh, uh, spinach, something that I really don't really want to eat. It's not very uh, usable by the microbes that live there. Uh, and this is a fairly regular pattern that happens year after year. And one of the questions that we're, we're beginning to get an answer to, but that we're still working on, is to try to understand why you get this decline from high, labile, high concentrations of labile DOC to low concentrations of refractory DOC uh, during the, the spring and summer. 
Now, to answer that question, um, I want to take it just a little side path and, and uh, talk a little bit about what, how, how we uh, think about strange mirrors. So, when we look at this map of the column, now we see this ribbon flowing through the landscape. And I think that if you imagine your, uh, um, you know, if you think about your favorite stream, and I'm North American, so I think about the Mississippi River, and you think about what it looks like. Well, how would you draw a picture of the Mississippi River? And when I ask my students this, what they tend to do is they draw a windy ribbon in the landscape, like this thing here. And this is, in fact, a picture of the Mississippi River. Now, this, this conception of a river led to this idea, and this is one of the few times that Leal Leopold was actually, you could argue that he may have been wrong about this, but that he considered rivers to just be gutters down which flow the rooms of continents. They're just, they're mainly transporters. And that there is some truth to that. But if you think about what the Mississippi River actually is, it's not this one-dimensional ribbon in the landscape. It's really this massive area, massive watershed that covers about half of the continental United States. And it's made up of not just the big river in the middle, but it also is composed of a million billion little streams that, that originate higher up in the landscape. Now, a million billion may be a slight exaggeration, but there are a lot of things. So, if you want to understand what's happening here, you really need to have a good sense for what's happening here and here and on all of these little streams. Um, now, I would argue that, and I'll, I'll say more about this in just a second, that these, these little streams have a, a potential to be extremely important in the landscape because the water that's coming off of the land uh, enters these little streams first. And I'll talk, I'll say another, a little bit more about that uh, in just a second. So I think what we need to do, once we have this conception, now we can really think of these rivers as transporters and transformers. They're not just passively uh, carrying materials down, they're actually processing this material and changing it and reducing the concentration. Um, Incidentally, if you have any questions, if, I, if I'm going too fast or if you want to stop me, just raise your hand and I'll stop and uh, I'll give you a chance to ask a question. Okay, so now we have a better sense for what a river actually is. So we have developed a model that, uh, a conceptual model that sort of gives us an idea of some hypotheses for why we see such low amounts and low bioavailability of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus in Colima River water that's exiting the watershed, um, that, that's exiting the watershed uh, late, later in the year, during the summer, when it's low on the fraction. So this is what we think is going on, and we have some evidence to support this now. But during the spring, uh, you're getting huge amounts of material being transported by this massive flood. So you get lots of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, and it's pretty bioavailable. Because it's cold and everything's being scoured, there's not really much of an opportunity for these aquatic ecosystems to transform this material. It's moving, it's moving, there's too much moving too fast, and everything's just getting pounded. So during the spring, it seems pretty clear that these uh, that this entire stream network that water's flowing through is a passive transporter, and that's why you have high concentration and bioavailability of materials uh, during that time of the year. And there's very little question that that's uh, what's, what's going on. Um, in the late summer and fall, I think things get more interesting because since we have, we know, the one thing we do know is that we have low concentration by availability. Now, there are two hypotheses for why that might be. One is that as the uh, discharge declines, you start to get a, uh, uh, a disconnection between the terrestrial, terrestrial inputs and the stream network. And the inputs themselves from the terrestrial zone are lower and they tend to be more refractory. And the streams then are still past the transporters. And just, the stuff's just wa washing right on through. The alternative is that we're still getting decently high input of materials, and this stuff is still is still labile, but it's being processed now in the stream network. So the stream network now becomes an active processor. So by the time you get to the mouth, this material is 
um, has been used up and, is, and what's left behind is just the refractory stuff. So, so we have these two alternative hypotheses. The, the stream network remains passive, uh, composed of passive transporters or these streams have now become actively or started to actively process this material because discharge is lower, the temperatures are higher, and there's more of a chance for interaction between the water column and the sediments, which is where the microbes and a lot of the physical processes are occurring that actually transform and remove this material. Okay, now I, I hope if, if, if that doesn't make sense, um, stop me now and make me either repeat that or ask a question about that if you have any, because that, that's sort of the context for what I'm about to show you. So I want to make sure that that particular conceptual model is clear. Okay, I'm going to move on then. All right, so the research questions that really motivate me, and I, hopefully not just me, are, are these. So I'm really interested in what these small streams are doing and that's sort of what I know what, how to do. So that's one of the, the contributions that I think I can make to the team. I want to understand how head, are, are these headwater streams actively processing or not. And if they are, I'm really interested in, in what Bill referred to as coupled biochemical cycles. I want to know how tightly coupled these CNP cycles are. Um, the reason I want to know that is because the relative amounts of these materials that are going to enter these streams could very easily change as permafrost thaws. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a second. So if nitrogen availability actually does affect carbon processing, and there are lots of reasons to think that it might, then we need to understand those linkages if we're really going to understand how, one, stream ecosystems are going to change in response to this material, and two, how, they're going to, how it's going to affect whether they are active transporters or not. Okay, I'm assuming uh, this is a weird format because I have no idea. You guys could all be asleep. I have no idea. Um, I'm getting, you know, so if, if you don't get this, if you're not understanding, please stop me and ask a question. You can also do that through chat if you don't feel like raising your hand. Now, part of the reason that we care about those two questions, actually, let me go back for a second. Part of the reason that we're interested in these two questions, at least that I am, is because I just think streams are really interesting ecosystems. So I just want to know how these things are functioning now. But uh, we also are interested because of this material. And this is uh, permafrost soil. And it, this is remarkable stuff. You can see these roots that just, it's just loaded with these roots. And, you know, when you're out there, I, I think if all goes well, you'll get a chance to sort of dig around in something like this. And you can see these roots look like they were produced yesterday. But in fact, in some, some of these roots are 10, 10 20,000 years old. So this is old stuff. Um, and it's been sitting there frozen for a long time. So it's old, but it's not processed. So there's still some good, yummy ginger snap material left in these roots. So when this stuff thaws out, that material will become available uh, and, and will re-enter the active uh, active uh, carbon and nutrient cycles. Okay, now, one of the key characteristics of global warming that I'm sure you've heard about and you'll certainly read about more if you haven't already is this phenomenon of Arctic amplification. Now, what, what that means is that you can see pretty clearly on here that the Arctic is, is warming faster than any other region on Earth. Now, that's, that's important partly because much of the Arctic is underlain by this stuff. In fact, the Coloma River is the largest river in the world, the largest watershed in the world, that's completely underlain by continuous permafrost. So there's a lot of this stuff out there, and it, and it has a lot of this carbon in it. So as the Arctic warms, uh, we're going to see that material become uh, uh, part of the active cycle again through uh, bank erosion. I think you'll probably hear some more about that from Yorin and Paul next week. Uh, and also just thawing in place. As the active layer uh, that's, that's thawing each year becomes a little bit deeper uh, each year, we're going to get some permafrost that's been frozen for a long time that's going to enter the active cycle. So to get a sense for why that matters, now this is a, a simplified version of the carbon cycle. And you know, you can actually think of the carbon cycle in, 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 as the balance between two processes, primary production 
and decomposition. If primary production is faster than decomposition, then you build up detritus in the soil. Now, if you're if you uh, some of the, some of this detritus is being captured in the permafrost, then what you've done what we've done is you've shifted the balance away from decomposition. So as permafrost uh, accumulates, it's, it's what basically what that means is that primary production is being greater than decomposition. Uh, this is certainly an oversimplification, but that's essentially what's going on. So when this permafrost thaws, now you get this material that's been sitting there for a long time that can either be processed in the soil or it's going to be released and it's going to be transported down the slope into aquatic ecosystems. And it's not just carbon. Uh, it also has nitrogen and phosphorus in it. So these materials are going to enter, the, enter these streams uh, together as, uh, in the same molecule. Now, the first thing that sees this material, the first aquatic ecosystem that sees this material, is, is often these little tiny streams that are flowing, that are flowing through the landscape. This is Erin Siebold. She is uh, one of our Polaris alumni. She and Travis Drake worked together in 2009-2010. And she is actually going to graduate school at Duke to do more of some of the kinds of work that I'm going to show you here in just a second. So uh, these little little streams are, are likely to receive this material. So we need to understand more about this. We need to know, one, how these things are functioning now. If we know that, then we have a chance at understanding what they might do differently uh, when, when this uh, permafrost thaw starts to change the composition of material that's coming in to these little streams. So we wanted to uh, get a better understanding of how these streams function. Now, to, to tell you about what, we, what I think we found, um, I need to take a little digression into stream biogeochemistry. And I'm going to start by talking to you about this concept here, this, this piece of theory called, that we refer to as nutrient spiraling. Now, we, the reason we call it nutrient spiraling, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll give you a little background. Um, if you uh, really abstract a nutrient cycle, you can think of it as a cycle, as a, as a circle. This is a closed nutrient cycle. This is the kind of thing that you see in those boring bathtubs called lakes that some people, for some reason, get excited about. I, I don't totally understand it. The water's not moving at all. In streams, at least the water's moving around. But you can imagine these circles uh, where inorganic is being converted into organic, which is then being converted back to inorganic again. Now, if you're here, if that's you, and you're looking upstream, the water's flowing towards it, you're going to see nutrients cycling that way. You're going to see these circles. If you're the guy or the person standing out here on the bank who's watching the stream flow by, what are you going to see? Well, I, I think most of you know what a slinky is, but it's just basically a spring, but slinkies, I like saying the word slinky better. If you look at a slinky on, on end, it looks like a circle, like this. So that's what uh, Mary Power, who's standing in the stream, can see. Now, if you're on the bank, what you do is you turn the slinky sideways and you stretch it out. And if you do that to a spring, what you see is a spiral. Because as things are moving, as things are cycling around in a circle, they're also moving downstream. So nutrient spiraling, what it basically is, is an acknowledgment that, that nutrients are cycling in the stream, yes, but they're also being transported strongly down, downhill. So the, the cycle is being stretched out in space by flow. Now, with, with what we can do then is we can actually start to examine and analyze nutrient spiraling, nutrient spirals and streams, and we can use this information to learn something and to compare different streams for how well they're processing material. And I'll keep I'll keep adding detail to that as we go through this. So the first thing to know is spiraling length. We can define that as the distance required to complete a nutrient cycle from inorganic to organic and back to inorganic again. Now, some really smart stream ecologists, so that's smarter than me, figured out that you can take that nutrient spiral and you can decompose it into components that we can then analyze more uh, intensively. And this, this, is, uh, uh, this concept is about 20 to 30 years old now. That we've, what, what, what these guys did is they figured out how to decompose the spiral into uptake length, which is the distance that it travels in the water column, the nutrient atom travels in the water column before it's taken up and converted into some organic form, like this knot or this snail. 
Then there's turn over length. And that's the distance that it travels in the, in the organic form, in the algae or in the, the invertebrate, before it's remineralized back to its inorganic form. Okay. Now, stream organisms are really good at hanging on in flow. So the turnover lengths tend to be short relative to uptake length. So most of this nutrient spiral happens in the water column. So as a consequence, much of the work that's been done has been developing methods for measuring uptake length. Now, the other reason that this is, an, is a really interesting and important uh, thing to be able to measure is that we can use it as an index for how efficient the stream is at using nutrients. So if you have a short uptake length for nitrogen and phosphorus, say, that means that a nitrogen atom doesn't travel very far along the flow before it's taken up by an organism. A long uptake length means that it travels farther downstream before it's taken up. So you can imagine, I think, you can, you can start to see that, that that would be related to demand for nutrients. So if demand is high, if these organisms are starving for nitrogen, they're going to take that stuff up more quickly than they would as another element that they're not starving for. All right, I'm going to pause for a second and give you a chance to ask the questions. Does anybody have a question about this material so far? Okay, great. In case you're wondering, there's just coffee in the mug. Now, how do we do this? How do we actually, um, how do we get, how do we measure up to point? Um, well, it's actually really a simple thing to do. Uh, we have, we, I say this like I was a big part of developing these. Um, these, those really smart streaming challenges I mentioned earlier, they worked out some methods using nutrient additions where you add a little bit of nitrogen, phosphorus, whatever element you're interested in to the stream, and then you watch how quickly it gets taken up as, it, as the water's moving downstream. And as, I, as you can imagine, a short uptake length means that things are taken up very quickly. So what we do, there are two different ways we do these experiments. I'm not going to go into a lot of methodological detail. I just want to give you just enough so that you can understand the data that I'm going to show you. Um, one of the things that we can do then is we can generate graphs that look like this. So here's, this is ammonium concentration in the water. And these, these uh, in the water right here. And then the points are samples that were collected at various distances downstream. And the change in concentration tells us something about how quickly things are taken up. So here's what we can do with these data. First of all, we do tend to get really high or really tight relationships when we do these things. Um, the slope of this line right here is this value right here called K. And the units of that value are per meter. So this, what, what we call this value is the proportional loss rate of ammonium from the water column during transport downstream. Now, we're looking for an uptake of length, which is going to be in meters. So, you know, if you, if you want that, all you got to do is take K and turn it over, and you end up with a length. So in this case, the ammonium uptake length for this, this particular stream is 434 meters. Okay, so what does that mean? You can interpret that as the average distance that an ammonium molecule travels before it's taken up from the water column. And so this is one number. What does that mean? What is, is that a long uptake length? Is that a short one? Well, all of that depends on the stream and the reach size and various other things, and I'll say some more about that when I'm showing you some data. Okay, I hope that made enough sense um, to, uh, to continue on. We're going to go one step further. If we do these experiments at a range of nitrogen concentrations, that's what that value right there is supposed to be, then we can basically plot uptake length, which we represent as S sub W, against nitrogen concentration. And this relationship uh, allows us to calculate a couple of interesting parameters. Now, the problem that we have when we do these experiments is that when you add nutrients, you actually do change the uptake rate. So when you give them more nitrogen, they'll take up nitrogen a little bit faster. 
So by doing the experiment, we actually alter the rate, and that's a bad thing. What we want is this thing here called ambient uptake length. We want to know what the uptake length is uh, when we don't add anything to the stream. So what we do basically is do it at a range of concentrations, and then we create this sort of, it's almost like a standard curve, a regression relationship that allows us to extrapolate back to this point here, which is what we refer to as the ambient uptake length. We can also calculate, now, the other thing, uptake, the other problem with uptake length is that, you, as you can imagine, it depends on how fast the water is moving. So you've got two streams of the same uptake. One is high discharge, one has low discharge. Uptake length will be longer when discharge is high. So we need to deal with that if we're going to compare streams. So that's what this equation here is meant to do. You can see that there's discharge in there, there's uptake length. So we're basically converting uptake length into an, or an uptake rate, and that is mass per area. So this is just per, per unit area of the stream bed. So now we've removed discharge as a problem. So this number here, U, if we look at uptake rates in two different streams, we can actually use that as a comparison of how active those streams are in processing materials. And if we plot uptake rates against nitrogen concentration, we tend to get these curves and we can fit equations to these curves. If any of you ha have experience with enzyme kinetics, this may look familiar. This is Michaelis Minton kinetics. Don't worry. If that doesn't mean anything to you, uh, just uh, pretend I didn't say it and we'll move on. It doesn't really matter for the analysis here. So this is what we're going to do. We're, we're, we've done these experiments. I'm going to show you some data that gives us an idea about uptake length in various streams, and then we're going to look at some uptake rates as well. So. Uh, these experiments are really fun, um, as you can imagine. Uh, it's great to sit down by these streams because you're never lonely, because you're constantly uh, uh, in the company of billions of mosquitoes that really do love you. Um, these are actually, I shouldn't say this because I don't want to scare anybody off, but I believe that we've had the worst um, mosquito experiences of any, uh, of any of the other groups that have worked out there. Um, I can tell you some horrific stories. Uh, of, we couldn't see where we were walking because there were mosquitoes covered our face so terribly. Um, if you watch the, the video, the main video that, that uh, Chris Linder made a couple of years ago, um, you'll hear me talking about this place being a hellhole. And I'm talking about one of these floodplain streams. And I think you hear Aaron complaining about this too. These, these, these can be kind of rough environments. But they're quite beautiful, and I think the, the work we're doing is actually important enough that it's worth it. Um, and Karen is saying, don't forget your bug eggs. I'm just going to reinforce that. You definitely have to have a bug tree for me. If you're, you're going to do this work, you have to be able to bundle up like uh, Kate and Blaze uh, did. All right, so what we've done is we've done these experiments in a bunch of streams that are draining Pleistocene soils. This is the, the Yetima streams that you may have read about. And this stuff is old and organic rich. It's kind of like that picture I showed you. We've also done this in some floodplain streams uh, that are draining Holocene soils that are younger and have been more processed because these are these floodplains get get, uh, get uh, reworked uh, frequently. So we just wanted to see if there was any difference between these different parts places in the landscape in terms of uh, nutrient processing. So what do we find? All right, here's some data. Finally, all right, so here we go. We got. We have, uh, we have uptake length here. Now, uh, don't worry about these two at the bottom. They don't really say anything that's not clear from the top graph. So we have uptake length here. We have uptake rates. And these are the, the results of a single nutrient addition in, uh, a ran in several Yetim and several floodplain streams that we did in 2009. And I, you know, if you look at the, the data, you can see what's happening here. Um, the uptake length for nitrogen and phosphorus in the Yetima streams are about the same. They're not significantly different from each other. But in the floodplain, the uptake lengths for nitrogen are quite a bit longer, an order of magnitude longer than uptake lengths for phosphorus. In fact, this, uh, when we get 450 meters in our reach, or the reaches we use were about 50 to 60 meters long, uh, we basically means that we really can't measure uptake length. But there's very little uptake going on in these streams. So in the context of our conceptual model, um, 
the blood plane is actively processing phosphorus. So we may be able to say that these blood plane streams are passively transporting nitrogen, while Yadama streams seem to be actively processing both, because we have these uptake lengths. So that, so think about what this means. So uh, this, uh, the, these Yadama streams in about 80 meters, on the average ammonium molecule only travels about 80 meters in a Yadama stream before it's taken up and put into an organic molecule. So this stuff is being processed. It's cycling over and over again as it moves through. And if these nitrogen atoms end up in bugs or in riparian trees or, or get processed in certain ways, they can actually leave the stream. So this leads to the possibility that these streams are actually going to remove nitrogen from the system um, that then will not be exported to the ocean. So uh, that's quite, quite important. Now look over here. We see the uptake rate shows a pretty much a similar pattern. These streams are all about the same size. So uh, I think we can, we, the, the um, preliminary conclusion here is that streams, yes, they can be actively, they can actively process this material, but it really depends on where you are in the landscape. I hope that wasn't way too many point, uh, too much use of the pointer there. I hope that doesn't, isn't dazzling. Okay. Now, I also said that we wanted to look at how um, these nitrogen, these, these element cycles are coupled. So I want to show you just a couple more data slides. I realize we're at seven now, and I'm going longer than I planned on it, but just bear with me. I'm almost done. Uh, here's a stream that flows from Devon Yar, which is a place that you'll see. Um, and this right here, N to P, is about four. Uh, what that means is the ratio of nitrogen availability to phosphorus availability in the stream water before we added any nutrients was about four. So what does that mean? Well, most organisms need nitrogen and phosphorus in a ratio of somewhere in the range of 10 to 30 or so. Um, so the, we tend to need a lot more nitrogen than we need phosphorus. So when you see an N to P of 4, you start to think, OK, that stream, the organisms living in that stream might, be, might need more nitrogen than they do phosphorus. So they might be more likely to take up ammonium than they would phosphate if we add it. Now, these curves here are showing uptake rates that we, that we collected at a range of, of enrichment concentrations. Now, at any given uh, enrichment concentration, you see that, that nitrogen uptake tends to be higher than phosphorus uptake here in Devonian Yard, which makes sense given that background N to P ratio. Now, here's Tyson Park. N to P is 32. So now there's a lot more nitrogen per unit phosphorus. These trees may be more likely to take up phosphorus than ammonia. And in fact, there's no red line on this graph because there was no measurable nitrogen uptake in Pleistocene Park stream. We added ammonium and it just washed, it washed downstream. It didn't get removed. While there was a decent amount of, of, of phosphate uptake. So that makes sense, right? So in the stream with low N to P, we saw higher N uptake. In the stream with high N to P, we saw higher phosphorus uptake. So that's good. So that suggests the world might actually work the way that we think it should. Now, we also did another experiment where we added phosphate by itself. Then we added right, then we added ammonium and phosphate together. And then we did another addition of phosphate alone. And basically, we wanted to, to see what happens to the uptake of one element when you add the other element. And what this is is a way for us to just get a, get a sense for how tightly coupled these element cycles might be. So this is the stream that we think is nitrogen limited. So when you, uh, you the phosphate uptake is not, these, these elements, there's no sign of coupling of NFT cycling in Devon and Yard, because it doesn't matter whether you add nitrogen or not, phosphate uptake is the same. <coughs> in Pleistocene Park, we see some sign of coupling, so that when you add phosphate alone, you get higher uptake than when you add phosphorus and nitrogen together. Now, we don't really quite understand what this means. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time, so I'm already going over my time talking about this. But this is the kind of result that suggests that these element cycles are affecting each other. Uh, but we don't understand what, these mechan what the mechanisms are for this. This is all pretty new stuff. In the uh, in Devon ER, where the NDP ratio was low, when you add ammonium by itself, you get higher nitrogen uptake than when you add ammonium with phosphate. So again, we see when we add the other element, 
you get a reduction in uptake of the element of interest. So again, we don't really understand that. Um, it's worth thinking more about this. I wish I had more time to kind of explain why I think this stuff is important. I'm more than happy to stick around and answer questions for a while. You can certainly uh, email me and we can talk again about this if you find this interesting. Um, but I think what I'm going to do is, is stop there. Um, we, the, the, the questions, these are, I just want to repeat the, that we, we do believe now that we have active processing of cycles in these water streams and we have some weird coupling going on that we don't quite understand. So we've got a lot of work yet to do there. Um, but I think I'll stop. This is one of Chris Linder's photos. Um, you'll get a chance, I think, well, hopefully we'll get a chance to hear from him a little bit uh, next week. But this is just one example of some of the amazing pictures that he was able to take. So thanks for listening. I hope that wasn't too fast and confusing. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand or send a chat. Um, if any of the other other uh, PIs out there, if you have anything you want to add, I'm going to turn my talk button off and let you guys uh, uh, say some things if you wish to. Okay. Um, either everybody has fell into, fallen asleep. I explained everything perfectly, uh, which that seems more likely to me. Um, or I uh, don't. Uh, if you have questions, uh, raise your hand. Um, but I think I'm going to wrap this up. So uh, feel free to send a chat if you want me to stop. But I'm just going to uh, add a couple things here. Um, next week, uh, we for sure have Paul, Yoreen, and Mike. Lorianti, Paul Mann, Yorin Bonk, and Mike Lorianti are going to are each going to get a little bit of a um, a little bit of information about their research interest and fill in some of the gaps that I may have left here. Hopefully, um, I'm also going to try to get Chris Linder to talk to us a little bit next week. So just uh, again, same time. It's always going to be at the same time. Um, uh, let me know if you have problems with any of this. I think everybody will be live next week, so we won't have to deal with the video part of this. So uh, thanks a lot for listening. Um, if you have any final comments, feel free to, to shout them out. But otherwise, I will see you all next week.